So what's the difference between hypertension and high blood pressure? You're the same. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I thought that was a trick question. <laughs> so one of the things is that, yeah, because sometimes we use these medical terms that people don't understand. So, uh, so hypertension is high blood pressure. Yeah, that's all. That's all. No, no, no trick. No trick. <laughs> now, if you hear us say hypertension, all we mean is high blood pressure. <laughs> okay, so here we have an agenda for today. We're gonna have. We're gonna run you through a little bit of an introduction of hypertension as well as types of hypertension. We're gonna talk a lot about measuring your blood pressure because you know that's really important to be able to know what blood pressure is. You need to know for us to know it's high, especially given the whole circumstances right now with COVID. A lot of you might be getting phone appointments or phone calls from Dr. Kearney to your house. So if you have a blood pressure machine ready, we can tell what your blood pressure looks like and you know, work around the hypertension and management of that from there. We're going to talk about the DASH diet, stress, as well as some medications that you may be taking. So we'll begin with an introduction to hypertension. So what it is and its risk factors. And for this, I'm going to pass it on to a fellow volunteer of mine named Henry. Yeah, so first we're just going to watch this video right here, and we're going to meet Emma. Run away again, play this video. <laughs> so they're going to play, they have to run away to play the video so we don't create uh, echoes in the room. Yeah. Fire away once it gets going. So it's interesting is that I think every family should have at least one blood pressure machine, maybe two. Um, is you got to know what your vital signs are, and you got to know what your blood pressure at home in different environments. I think it's so important. Uh, you know, machines vary in price, um, but a reasonable machine is usually around $100, um, and it's a great investment. And, um, um, I like it so much, I have a few hundred of them. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's good. We'll turn you how to how to measure it. And some people feel that high blood pressure is one of the, the most important risk factors because it's very responsible for stroke. And we're going to learn how to uh, lower your blood pressure. Just lowering it a little bit uh, is important. You can lower the combination of lifestyle and drug therapy. The mistake that many people do, including some physicians... Oh, that's a big one. Keep going. No, keep going. Keep going. You're good. I want to hear about this. It's a beautiful fall evening. The sun is setting. The dog finally stopped barking. Life is good. But inside, there's trouble brewing. And Emma has no idea. Although she feels fine, like her father, Emma is one of the 67 million adults in the U.S. with high blood pressure or hypertension. Just like her radiator that's on the fritz, Emma's heart is working overtime to get the job done. Let's have a look. The heart is the pump in our bodies, delivering blood to the entire system through a set of pipes or blood vessels of all sizes. Smoking, high cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, physical inactivity, family history, and increased age all contribute to these blood vessels or our pipes becoming less elastic. The more blood our heart has to pump through stiff, narrowing arteries, the higher our blood pressure. When the force of the blood against our artery walls is too high, life-threatening health problems can result. Problems like kidney disease, heart disease, stroke, even heart attack. Can Emma get her pressure down before it's too late? I think it's wonderful. So we have lots of pipes in our body called vessels, arteria. Right. Okay, so I'm back. <laughs> All right, so I do need to run away in order to play these videos, but hopefully, you know, I'm getting my exercise in at the same time. So, yeah, so meet Emma. She, uh, you know, like she mentioned, the video mentioned, uh, hypertension is a uh, disease that sort of revolves around the increasing blood pressure or pressure in the blood vessels. And it is very, very common. So here I'm going to pass it off to Mary May once more to tell us about hypertension. Yeah, so if we were to just have some sort of definition for hypertension, it would probably be that uh, your blood pressure, which is basically the force of your blood pushing against the walls of your arteries, um, is consistently too high. 
And so um, what this looks like, we're going to see if we click, we're going to look at the chart. Yeah, and just to explain this chart, we're first going to get a little brief introduction to how we can interpret the numbers. So I'm sure everybody here has heard of the classic 120 over 80. But what does that really mean? Um, technically, these are two different numbers, and um, they mean two different things. So the first number, the 120, uh, is going to be your systolic blood pressure. And so this is basically um, your blood pressure when your heart contracts. And then the other one is your diastolic uh, blood pressure, and this is essentially in between the beats when the heart is resting. And, and so now if we take a better look at this chart, we can see that there's different categories for your blood pressure. Uh, we've got normal, elevated, high blood pressure, which is uh, hypertension stage one. We have hypertension stage two, and then a hypertensive crisis. And the thing that differs between all of these is the actual reading, so the actual pressure. Um, with normal, we have numbers that are less than 120 and less than uh, 80. With an elevated blood pressure, we have 120 to 129 and then less than 80. Uh, with stage 1 hypertension, we have 130 to 139 and then 80 to uh, 89 and so on and so forth. So one thing I want to just make certain here is that uh, all individuals are going to have different blood pressures and there's going to be different diseases that are going to um, increase your risk or, or maybe decrease your risk. And so one common example is, I think, diabetes. Because um, diabetes, when you have diabetes, you should uh, essentially have um, some sort of blood pressure that's lower than 130 over 80. Otherwise, it's going to be considered very high risk. And so, just give me one second. So it's interesting that blood pressure varies a lot. It's the average blood pressure is important. And blood mm -hmm. pressure in the doctor's office is always is always is always higher. Rough yeah. ten millimeters of mercury. So uh, let's go to the next slide. Let's go. To, mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we often think about hypertension, I think one of the scariest things about it is that there aren't really any symptoms. However, we do have a couple of symptoms here and there which um, are indirectly related to hypertension, and and the ones that are really common are things like dizziness, blood spots in the eyes facial flushing, lightheadedness, shortness of breath, vision problems, and the last one is nosebleeds. Um, I think out of all of this, the most interesting one is nosebleeds, because um, I'm sure a lot of us have heard this like really famous myth that, oh, if you have hypertension, you're going to get a lot of nosebleeds, and whenever you get a nosebleed, you know that's hypertension. This isn't always the case. It's not a very... Here's something right. to think about. The leading cause of nosebleeds, what do you think the leading cause of nosebleeds is in North America? Turns out it's picking your nose. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you, you might be picking your nose um, and you might get a nosebleed. That does not mean you have hypertension, right? So this is one of the biggest myths out there. Wow. These are very nonspecific symptoms. So that's why exactly. it, measuring your blood pressure, knowing your blood pressure um, is it, kind of important. I can have facial flushing because I just uh, surprised my wife with a, with a, with a special gift and... Uh, and, and chimney on our flushing, I guess, or I feel lightheaded because of the hot weather, or so. Um, uh, so, so it's always good to know where you stand. So, one thing I always worry about when people say I'm dizzy, what's your blood pressure? It's a great question to know, uh, especially if you get up and you get dizzy and you, and you don't measure your blood pressure. How do you know what your blood pressure is? Well, measure exactly. So, whenever we're in doubt. Just because of all these symptoms being so general, measure, measure, measure. And we're going to really drill that in today. Um, so uh, I guess if we go to the next slide, we can see, um, you know, we might ask ourselves, well, these symptoms aren't, aren't uh, there aren't any real symptoms. There are only indirect symptoms. So why should we really care about this disease? And, and the answer, I think, to that really lies in, in epidemiology and, and looking at just Canada as a whole. Currently, we have one in five Canadians that are affected by hypertension, and estimates put it at 90% of Canadians, which are going to develop hypertension over their lifetime. And I think that this is a very scary statistic, especially 90%, because when we look at the things that hypertension can develop and lead to, we can see that there, this is a very serious problem. And so the ones I have listed here are stroke, heart attack, heart failure, kidney disease, vision loss, sexual dysfunction, and atherosclerosis. So, it's really important. I heard 9-0. 90% of Canadians 
or That's less correct. to develop high blood pressure in one's lifetime. That's correct, yes. So why doesn't everybody have their own blood pressure machine? I don't know. That is the question. So the answer is that you got to get one. Um, and I just, I, I just, you know, it's, 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 and we're going to actually show you how we can make you live longer by just having a blood pressure machine. So what I'm saying to everyone that I know, if I care about you, I say you should have a scale and a blood pressure machine. Uh, those are two essential ingredients. If I have dinner at home, I would rather eat with my hand, but my wife doesn't like that idea. So your knife and fork for eating, your blood pressure and your scale for your health. And if you can't afford both, I get, I, I, I'd eat with my hands and get a blood pressure machine and a scale. Exactly. A joke. <laughs> <laughs> So if we look at some of these risk factors, we can see that there's two different types mainly. We have controllable risk factors and uncontrollable risk factors. Now the controllable ones are the ones that we can take charge of and the ones that we can basically change. So these include the following. And if we look at it, being overweight or obese, essentially what happens is the more you weigh, the more blood you're going to need to supply oxygen and nutrients to. And the more blood that's going to be circulating, the, uh, the increase there's going to be an increase in the pressure of your artery walls. The next one there is really big, physical activity. So essentially what happens is people who tend to have uh, less physical activity, they're the ones that are going to also have um, increased heart rates. And so this just puts extra pressure on your heart to, to contract and, and pump the body and pump blood to the entire body. Um, the other ones there, we've got things like tobacco use, uh, alcohol intake, uh, this one's really important, high salt intake. And this one is scary because uh, the statistic I read on high salt intake is that nearly 2 million Canadians, currently 2 million Canadians with hypertension, got uh, their hypertension because of just increased um, and high salt intake. Uh, with regards to that, we also have something on the opposite end. We have low potassium intake. We see that a lot of people have too little potassium in their diet. Essentially, what potassium does is that it, it um, balances out the amount of sodium you have in your cells. And so, if you don't get enough potassium, you're going to have too much sodium. And as we just saw, too much sodium is bad. And then again, we also have uh, things like stress. Now, okay. If you look on to the... Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Hold on for a sec here. So, one of the things you mentioned is that uh, high salt foods. So, salt, in some people's mind, is a controversial area. There's always controversy, mm -hmm. but where is most of the salt found, do you think, everybody? What do you think, Paul? Processed foods. Processed foods. So 60% of calories are in processed foods. Now, processed foods are designed to make you eat more. And I don't know you, is I'm trying to design myself to eat less. And so, uh, and salt tastes good. Traditionally, uh, when people went to a bar, uh, they put salty snacks because you drink 25% more. They're not doing that to be nice to you. They're, they're, they're just making they cause you to drink more. <laughs> now, Paul, um, where do you find high potassium foods? High potassium foods? A lot of just natural foods, fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so no. <laughs> fruits, so what we want to do is take the processed foods, which is 60% of most of our calories, and replace it by real home food. And basically, we find a huge amount of potassium in fruits and vegetables, especially vegetables. And so you want to replace the salt with potassium. And that will lower your blood pressure tremendously. Um, we are going to dive more into depth in this as well when you talk about the DASH diet. So Stuart's going to cover the DASH diet later on. Make sure you pay really close attention to that as well. Exactly. And so basically to me, processed foods just sounds like a lose-lose situation. There's, there's no real benefit to it. Um, and then if we look at the other side, we have uncontrollable um, risk factors. And the one thing I want you guys to all notice is that there are definitely way less uncontrollable um, risk factors. And the two main ones being age and like family history and, and genetics. So your risk of high BP is uh, definitely going to increase as you age. And then um, things like uh, high blood pressure, or hypertension, it runs a lot in families. So you'll see that family history plays a large um uh, effect into that. 
and with that said, however, you know, if, if you may know that you're highly predisposed for hypertension because both your parents had it, that's even more of a reason to start aiming at those controllable risk factors, like getting the weight down and getting the salt intake down as well. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, I think I think you age slower. And I, I, we have some anti-aging tricks. <laughs> so in most hypertensive patients, uh, the general goal is to lower the systolic blood pressure to 130 mg mercury and to lower the diastolic blood pressure to less than 80 millimeters of mercury. To clarify, um, systolic blood pressure is the one um, you know, if ever you take your blood pressure at home, you have two numbers. You have the upper number and the lower number. So systolic is the upper number, and it represents the pressure when your heart is contracting. Diastolic is the lower number. It represents the pressure when your heart is relaxing. So it's natural to find the systolic pressure to be higher, because as the heart contracts, it pushes blood with a lot more force. Um, so these are the two numbers we're looking at here, the 130 and the the third number you often get on a blood pressure machine is the heart, the heart rate. That's important to know that too as well. So um, keep going. So this kind of target has been pretty consistent in both American and European uh, guidelines. And something important to note though is that the target blood pressure is going to differ from person to person. So it's not um, a hard and a hard fast rule to go for everybody, um, especially if you have certain conditions like chronic kidney disease or if there's a factor of uh, difference in age. Uh, lower is often better though, so as long as it's not causing certain symptoms of, uh, such as dizziness, and we'll touch on that um, later on in this slide. Uh, there's a, there is a lower limit though, uh, so you don't try not to exhibit those symptoms of dizziness and whatnot. Uh, this lower limit is 120 over 70. Let and um, make a comment. We are designed for blood pressures around 90 over 70. And so if your blood pressure is naturally low, that's a phenomenally good, good thing to have. I wish I had a, a, a blood pressure of 90 over 70. Um, turns out the best blood pressure is closer to around 110 over 70. Um, but we don't, when we lower blood pressure too much and too vigorously, we can make you dizzy. So. If someone says my blood pressure is 90 and you feel great, great, um, especially if it's natural in the environment here. It's how we look at that. So keep going. That's good information. Thank you. So, so some, some analysis that they've done in regards to the lower limits of uh, treatment goal in hypertensive patients is that they found a, a bit of a phenomenon where there's this correlation between this drastic lowering of blood pressure and an uh, increase in risk of cardiovascular related complications. And this has been coined as the J-curve phenomenon, which you can see in the uh, picture that's on the screen right now. Uh, so there's that in the middle, there's that kind of target area that you want to get to. But if you go too low, your uh, cardiovascular um, risk starts to increase. And then if you go too far to the right, which is going to be increasing your blood pressure too much, there's also um, increased risk there as well. Although this so kind of... The, um, the diastolic blood pressure, the second number now, we talked about the systolic number being that when the heart contracts, the second is when the heart relaxes, and that's related to elasticity of the vessel wall itself. So unfortunately, as we get older, many of us lose elasticity of our blood vessels and the diastolic will fall uh, to very low numbers. So that's basically um, the best way to increase elasticity of arteries is not to get old. Um, if, 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 or not to gain weight, lose weight, and exercise. So, you know, you can improve your elasticity or prevent that loss of elasticity through, through exercise, through activity, and uh, keeping your, your, your body as skinny as you possibly can. Um, this J-shaped curve comes and goes uh, at times. So, I believe having a too low a diastolic blood pressure is predominantly uh, not much you can do too much about. Um, uh, but is that you have to decide how much to lower blood pressure, and that's an individual decision you'll have to make with your, with your, with your doctors. The J-shaped curve tends to be more common in people who already have blockages that are taking place. If you never had a blocked artery, this J-shaped curve doesn't appear to be very common. Um, so um, 
So, so don't 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 get sidetracked about that that diastolic blood pressure too much. The best way to treat it, as I said, is to exercise, keep the weight down. And so, if as previously mentioned, um, you do want to lower your blood pressure as long as it's not causing symptoms of hypertension, which is too low of a blood pressure. So, if you uh, feel that you're experiencing symptoms like dizziness, uh, nausea, syncope, which is fainting, blurry vision, lack of concentration. Uh, go talk to your doctor, Dr. Bernie, about your blood pressure medications and your kind of symptoms. So people who complain of dizziness to me, one of the questions I see, do you get dizzy when you stand up and walk around? That usually means your blood pressure may be falling. In that case, I'll ask you to, or what you should do is measure your blood pressure at home while you're sitting and then standing. Now, blood pressure tends to go down when you stand. Uh, that's a very natural phenomenon for many of us, and it gets more common as we get older. So if you think that's bothering you, just do a bunch of blood pressure sitting and standing and walking around, so just to, to document that. And just write it down. Um, and then bring it in, and we'll talk about that. Wonderful. Thank you for uh, sharing that. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit of also on uh, why it's important for us uh, in the clinic and for you as patients to screening your hypertension as well. So Nermi mentions a whole bunch of uh, possible things that could go wrong if you have high blood pressure. You mentioned things like stroke and heart disease. So let's take a look at what happens when we end up treating our blood pressure too. So here I have a study. Um, it's a meta-analysis, which just means a grouping or a bunching of 123 randomized control trials. So if you remember way back from our um, understanding uh, science webinar, randomized control trials are the highest quality of evidence. So this one study pulled findings from over 600,000 patients. That's a lot of people and that way they're able to get a lot of precision with their studies. And it showed for every 10 uh, uh, millimeters of mercury reduction in the systolic blood pressure, so that's the upper number, there is a 20% reduced risk of cardiovascular events. There is 17% reduction of coronary heart disease, 27% reduction of stroke, 28% reduction of heart failure, and 13% reduction of mortality. So by treating your blood pressure, getting that num uh, upper number down, at least for every increment of uh, 10 millimeters of mercury, there seems to be very drastic benefits. Um, one of the biggest ones here being heart failure and stroke that I'm going to talk about as well. Um, heart failure, like you may have heard from our other webinars or from Dr. Kearney, is definitely on the rise and it's one of the leading causes of uh, death with cardiovascular disease now as well. well. Let's just pause for a second. By lowering your blood pressure, by just 10 millimeters of mercury, you can have a reduction of mortality of over 10%, reduction in heart attacks by close to 20%, reduction of strokes close to 30%, and reduction in the development of future congestive heart failure by close to 30%. This is magic. Or it's not magic, this is science. And Please apply the science to you. And you know, when people say well, the blood pressure is only high in Dr. Curry's office, nowhere else, well, let's find out because look, look at these benefits. Now, most of the studies are the blood pressure that's measured in the doctor's office. So, you know, there's three ways of measuring blood pressure, as we'll talk about. There's a doctor blood pressure's office, there's your home blood pressure, and there's a machine called an Ambitora 24 blood pressure monitor. And they all Give somewhat different information, but very much complementary information. But if I had my take a picture of this, take a picture. I'm going to take a picture of this myself. I take pictures of all sorts of things. Um, but this is really a very important slide. So one of the things I heard before is that 90% of Canadians will develop hypertension in their lifetime, and that just small changes in blood pressure translates to dramatic, meaningful clinical benefit. Wow. Very, so this is, again, you can see the importance of treating your blood pressure if you do have hypertension, high blood pressure. A um, lot of benefits right across the board. And that's because high blood pressure does cause a lot of damage within your body as well. So here we can take a look at heart failure. 
To the left here, we have what's called the H2F score. What's heart failure, Paul? Heart failure is uh, when the heart is inadequate at pumping blood to the rest of your body. As you know, you can think of the heart almost like an engine. You have to, you know, there's certain times where the engine just gives out in your car. And, you know, there's not, you have to keep up the maintenance and similar to your body, you have to keep up your health to make sure your heart stays nice and strong and it's able to pump body or blood throughout the body. So if you look, you can see the symptoms of congestive heart failure from shortness of breath to swollen legs. There's two types of heart failure. One is the heart, the heart pump can't pump properly. That's called systolic dysfunction. We have a wonderful video on that, on, on heart failure and shortness of breath. The second is diastolic heart failure, the heart becomes stiff. And that's now the leading cause of heart failure. And Paul's going to tell you goes through this, the scoring system. Yeah, so there's a few things that we look for to help us predict the probability of heart failure. Um, so, you know, are you heavy? Is your BMI over 30 kilograms uh, per meter squared? And we're actually going to talk a little bit about BMI later today, but you know, if you're very, very obese or very uh, overweight, it increases your probability of having heart failure. Now, the next one here is something that I think is very important. Are you hypertensive? Do you have high blood pressure? Because having high blood pressure does increase your risk of heart failure as well. That's a very key one. I want you to keep that in mind as you continue talking about high blood pressure for the rest of the day. Um, if you have atrial fibrillation, so uh, this is an irregular heart rhythm that some of you may be familiar with. If you have pulmonary hypertension, so a lot of what we're talking about today, uh, when you mention hypertension, we mean you know, the blood vessels throughout your body. There is also another set of blood vessels that go towards your lungs. So if you have high pressure in the blood vessels around your lungs, uh, that can also increase the risk of heart failure. So unlike the blood pressure you measure at home, pulmonary hypertension is something that we measure in clinic using echo. Um, if you are elderly, so above the age of 60, that does also increase your risk of heart failure. And finally, filling pressure is one more thing that we measure in the clinic when you look at your echocardiogram. And if you have a filling pressure greater or an E to E prime ratio greater than 9, uh, which is something that we're able to see on our end, then it does once again increase your probability of heart failure. So you can see here, all you really need are four, five, six different um, six different predictors and your, your risk shoots right up to about 80% to 90% of heart failure. Um, and once more, I just want to emphasize hypertensive. So if you have high blood pressure, uh, you do increase your risk of heart failure once more. So, uh, you know, there's some, there's, the things that you can do is, you know, the weight is, a, is something that we can help. Uh, getting old, I don't know how to, to, to slow that process down, but you can help the age and, uh, and you can age better. Um, and I've seen so many older people say, you know, I'm tired, I have no energy. Well, uh, I have lots of energy. Um, and uh, and uh, that's basically through taking care of myself and, and luck as well. A lot, there's, there's a lot of luck involved. And you mentioned high blood pressure. If Most people who have serious high blood pressure will require multiple medications. So these are something you can think about. Now, the... the Things such as pulmonary hypertension and filling pressure, that's something I look at when I do an ultrasound test of your heart to give us some clues. But how much you weigh, what your blood pressure is, and how many medications you require um, to treat your blood pressure is basically on your part. The more lifestyle changes you do, the less need for medication there are. Um, so these, these are important. And right now in our society, which turning out one of the leading causes of death because we're li living longer is congestive heart failure. The inability of the heart to pump adequately to your, your vital organs or the heart has to pump to your vital organs at a very high pressure. Uh, well, these are things within our control to, to a large degree. Okay, I'm not going to spend too long on stroke, but once more, here we have another scoring system to help us predict uh, the chance and risk of stroke. Once more here, you can see hypertension is on the scoring system. Uh, so having high blood pressure does again increase your risk of stroke. Now, I do have to tell you for some people, um, you know, this risk, you don't, we don't, you don't need to check mark everything on this list to think 
or believe that you're at considerable risk of stroke. Even just a few of these check marks is enough to warrant some sort of treatment as well. So hypertension, once more, puts you at risk of stroke. So here you can see with these two examples, these are obviously two diseases that we would want to avoid to the best of our ability. Um, and we can do that by managing hypertension. That, that risk factor profile was developed for people who have atrial fibrillation, but it also works outside of the role of atrial fibrillation. And you can see that um, there's so much you can do to keep yourself healthy. Um, don't ignore your health. Take an active interest in it. So we're going to talk a little bit about the types of hypertension, and I believe I'm passing it on to Stuart for this. Thank you, Paul. Um, so next, as Paul mentioned, we're going to talk about a few different variations of hypertension. Uh, you may fall into one of these categories or several, so you can kind of see, based on your history, which one applies to you most. First, we'll start off with primary hypertension. So in primary hypertension, oftentimes there's no specific identifiable cause. It could be a number of factors throughout your life. Um, or through DNA or genetics that has contributed to this high blood pressure. Things like genetics, as I said, uh, but also lifestyle, um, such as your diet, uh, obesity, uh, your level of exercise each day. Um, these are all factors that can contribute to primary hypertension. Moving over to the right, you'll see secondary hypertension. In this case, secondary hypertension is due to some pre-existing health condition. Now. The pre-existing health condition in many ways could have been contributed to a lot of those factors I previously mentioned, such as your level of stress, your diet, your physical activity levels. And so things that can contribute to secondary hypertension um, are very much the same as primary hypertension. So if Paul, you want to click onto the next little bit. Um, the important thing to note here is that for both of these, primary or secondary hypertension, they can be managed in very similar ways. We're gonna go at length throughout our presentation to discuss a number of different lifestyle interventions, give you a number of ideas, and see if these are ideas that you can implement into your life. So first off is diet, second off is physical activity, and of course, whenever you come into the clinic, doctor takes a look at all of your symptoms, all of your results, and he prescribes the appropriate blood pressure medications uh, to maximize your cardiovascular health. Uh, Paul, if you want to click onto the next slide. And the first type of typical hypertension we see uh, is just what I said, common typical hypertension, where you have elevated blood pressure at all hours of the day. Next is something quite unique, and I learned a little bit about this through my research. It's masked hypertension. So this is often the case where somebody has a high blood pressure at home, but when they come in to see Dr. Kernu uh, or any of their health professionals, their blood pressure is lower than what they normally find. Uh, next, you have nocturnal hypertension. This is when your blood pressure is elevated in the nighttime, but usually more normalized throughout the day. And finally, you may be familiar with the term white coat hypertension. This often happens when an individual experiences elevated blood pressure whenever they come into the clinic or a healthcare setting. The important thing to note about white coat hypertension is that this is often the reading that doctor goes off of uh, when he's looking at all of your information. So the important thing and the important takeaway message here is that it's important to measure your blood pressure as regularly as possible. Make it a part of your routine. Invest in a blood pressure meter so you can measure your blood pressure and keep an accurate log of all this information. This is going to not only help you, but it will also help Dr. Kernu make a complete and accurate assessment in order to maximize your overall health whenever you come in and visit us in the clinic. So if we can move on then. Uh, so yeah, exactly as I mentioned, um, Measuring your blood pressure regularly can help Dr. Kernu and us volunteers appropriately manage your health for the long term. With that, I'll pass so it over. I'm going to nitpick on one of these uh, one of these types of hypertension, the nighttime or nocturnal hypertension, because this is one that might be a little bit new to a lot of you. Um, so nocturnal hypertension, like Stuart mentioned, is when your blood pressure is higher than we would actually expect it to be. Uh, during the night. So let me show you a light, nice little graph here. Typically how your blood pressure looks is in the morning your blood pressure comes up uh, and then throughout the day it stays pretty high 
when you go to bed, your blood pressure typically should fall lower. Um, and, you know, actually by the Canadian guidelines, your blood pressure should drop by at least 10% when you go to bed. Um, now, this is a very normal thing. It's a natural thing. It do, it's due to hormonal changes in your body during sleep. However, some problems can arise when the body does not drop that 10% as we would expect it to. So uh, the 2020 Canadian Hypertension Guidelines defines nocturnal hypertension or high blood pressure at night as a drop that's less than 10%. Like I mentioned, the 10% or greater is expected. But if it doesn't, if you don't drop when you're sleeping, you're at greater risk of cardiovascular disease and organ damage. So here we can see what that looks like. Uh, here you can see in the solid line is what a normal pattern would be for, uh, for blood pressure. It goes down while you're sleeping. We call this pattern a dipper pattern. However, for some individuals, they don't drop when they're sleeping. So it stays quite high. And this can be dangerous because your blood pressure is high almost literally 24 hours of the day. Um, and this can have, like I mentioned, increased risk of organ health. So it is common in patients with uh, advanced age. A lot of the same risk factors that Stuart and Nermay mentioned, so the salt, the diabetes, um, obesity. And it can be caused by other uh, factors like poor sleep quality or sleep apnea. Uh, stress is a huge one. Finally, uh, in very advanced hypertension, so hypertension that hasn't been treated for a very long time, it can lead to this non-different pattern. So what's kind of interesting is that the blood pressure should fall at night time and you can see some of the conditions that does not allow it to fall. One of the most important things I think about is they call sleep apnea, where you stop sleeping at night time. Sometimes we use these machines called nasal CPAP to assist you, but one of the best therapies at this point in time, I hate to say this, is weight reduction. Um, so. And you can see that blood pressure fluctuates. So what I want to remember people is that, you know, one day your blood pressure is 200 over 110. It's not a catastrophe. Uh, just sit and relax, measure it again, because it should go up and down. If I'm at the dentist's office, I just got a bill, my blood pressure should be 210 over 110. Um, and when I'm relaxed, uh, with a nice encounter, with a nice patient bringing in, uh, a smile on their face, my blood pressure will fall to 110 over 70. Well, those are normal variations. Sometimes we'll be even very low, and then these machines aren't perfect as well. They make mistakes, especially if you have extra heartbeat for a thing called atrial fibrillation. You can hear outside it's raining, so, you know, yesterday I just heard that, uh, that the farmers are in trouble, but looks like um, we, um, we're, we're getting some good rain tonight. Nice. And, uh, that's good. Yeah. So like Dr. Kearney mentioned, fluctuation in your blood pressure is completely normal. Uh, you know, you, that's why we take average blood pressures and you should, if you do have problems with your blood pressure, we do recommend you take it multiple times or a few times a week so we can see that fluctuation as well. Um, so don't be too worried about some isolated incidents. We're more worried if your blood pressure stays consistently high. Okay. So uh, nocturnal hypertension is managed in a very similar way with the same medications, the same diet and weight reduction. Um, however, a lot of the time we use bedtime dosing rather than morning dosing. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a sec. The lifestyle changes, you know, it seems like every week we talk about this. It always, always comes back to the lifestyle changes just because, you know, your heart is such a crucial organ and it's greatly affected by all the decisions you make in your day-to-day -day life. Um, and it's like Dr. Kearney mentioned, sleep apnea. I'm going to talk about this one trial called the uh, IGEA chronotherapy trial. So this was a randomized control trial, so once again the highest quality of evidence, with 19,000 patients that were followed for six years. So every year they checked ambulatory blood pressure, so Nick is going to tell, or Nicholas is going to tell us a little bit about, the, about that later on. It's essentially a machine that you wear for 24 to 40 hours, and it checks your blood pressure throughout that entire time. So these 19,000 people wore this machine for 48 hours to check their blood pressure every year. And this, these 90,000 people were split up into two groups. One group of patients was told to take their blood pressure uh, pills immediately when waking. 
The other group was told to take their blood pressure pills at bedtime. And so results showed that uh, compared to those who took their pills in the morning, the patients who took their pills at bedtime had about uh, 4 millimeters of mercury systolic reduction while sleeping, 13% uh, fewer non-dipper patients, so it did help treat that nocturnal hypertension, 45% reduction in cardiovascular events compared to those who took it in the morning, 56% reduction in cardiovascular health, 34% uh, reduction in heart attacks, 42% reduction in heart failure, and 49% reduction in stroke. So as I mentioned, those who have nocturnal hypertension or high blood pressure in the night are a lot more at risk for a lot of these diseases. So they're a lot more at risk for heart attacks, they're more at risk for stroke and heart failure. And one way that we manage that is to give them their blood pressure pills to take at bedtime. And we do see that there are benefits uh, in this group compared to taking it in the morning. That's quite interesting. So that's something that uh, the medical world has not totally digested. There's been some conflicting data, but this is a well-done randomized trial that's big of 19,000 patients showing taking blood pressure pills before going to bed versus early in the morning made, made a big impact. Now, these were people with only moderate high blood pressure. Uh, they were taking on average couple pills. They weren't taking three or four pills. They were taking about two pills on average. It reminds me that most people with serious high blood pressure will require multiple medications. Um, there's a trial using aspirin in the past that showed taking aspirin at nighttime work better compared to uh, the morning time. Paul was showing that there's an early rise in blood pressure in the morning time, so taking it at nighttime may blunt that surge of hormones such as catecholamines in the morning time. So this is something that we're thinking about. So all things being equal, um, we should consider this a lot more. And uh, this is evolving right now. So one other pro is that maybe taking your blood pressure pills at nighttime may have a great impact. Now, if you're taking more than two pills a day uh, for high blood pressure, you have to reconsider that strategy. So I'm, I'm, I go through phases about this, and I thank you for showing us again. And uh, We'll look at some more data about this. This is very impressive. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to talk about measuring your blood pressure because, you know, like I mentioned, especially in these COVID-19 era um, and today's day and age, uh, you know, a lot of you may not be coming to clinic or you may be receiving phone calls from the clinic. So it's really important to know how to take your blood pressure yourself and how to take it the right way. So, in terms of taking your blood pressure correctly, there's quite a few things that you want to try to keep in mind. So, firstly, you want to make sure that you haven't had coffee or a smoke within 30 minutes prior to taking your blood pressure. Uh, this could often raise uh, the readings that you'll find. And you also want to make sure that you're six seated quietly for at least five minutes. In the video, uh, and the next slide uh, mentions 15. You also want, don't want to talk during the measurement, as hard as this can be, especially if there's someone sitting across from you. This could, this could increase your measured blood pressure. And if you take your morning readings before uh, your medications, try to note this down and uh, tell your doctor about it. So something that I actually didn't know until this week was that you're actually supposed to take measurements three, ti uh, three times per week or two times per day. Uh, so once in the morning and once in the evening, it, uh, if your condition requires you to really closely monitor your blood pressure. And so something to hammer home here is that when people say to check your blood pressure, it really needs to take three consecutive readings. So we're going to go through an example at the end of the slide as well. So you want to discard the first reading because this is often inaccurate. And then you're going to take the second and third readings, and you're going to average those, and that's going to be your final number. And you're, you could do the same with heart rate, too, because that's going to be your third number. Okay. Okay. We're going to pause here for a second. So we traditionally measure blood pressure in the doctor's office. That's probably not the world's best place to measure blood pressure. I encourage everybody to use their home machine. It will show you how to use it again. Is that you want to take three measurements. The first one is usually always the highest. And the average of the second and third is very reasonable to do this. You want to be comfortable seating. Um, 
I don't know if anybody wants to smoke anymore. I understand how hard it is. So again, no coffee or smokes for 30 minutes. Uh, you want to be seated with your with your back rested on a, on a backrest of some sort. Feet flat on the ground. Your heart, at, your, your arm is at heart level. Um, so it's supported. Uh, it's not flanging in the wind. It's basically on the kitchen table. Um, and make those measurements. So someone, someone calls me up. Well, I didn't measure my blood pressure, Dr. Kearney. Should I do it now? Um, it's helpful, but the best time would have been done when you're in a quiet environment. Um, I understand we can't always really want to, but that's basically the great way of measuring blood pressure. And thank you for showing that. And it's multiple reading. And blood pressure should fluctuate. And also remember, these machines are not perfect. They make mistakes. And if you have extra heartbeat or atrial fibrillation, it's harder for the machine make these measurements as well. So, uh, so those are important. A key takeaway is uh, Nicholas made a nice little uh, table here that really demonstrates it. So every time you're quote unquote checking your blood pressure, you take it three times in a row, discard the first reading and average the second and third reading. That is checking your blood pressure just one time. You need to do it three times in order to check your blood pressure. I understand some people have very low blood pressures, and if you, if, you know, if the first one is low, um, you need to make sure as strict as this. But if you really want to know your blood pressure properly, this is the best way to do it. We have this nice little video here. I'm going to go run away again. Play this out loud. One thing that before Paul shows is you can see that the video shows that that, that little cuff there that get where the pipe goes in there is pointed downwards, and that is over. That, um, that the brachial artery there. So you can see this. So if that little device is pointing up to your head, it's on, it's on backwards. So, and I've done that. I think we've all done that. So uh, and it's a little, little something to remember. Is that it's okay. We're all learning. So um, we're, we're, and uh, you want to get the appropriate size blood pressure cuff. And some people with really big arms, it's hard to get an extra large cuff. So we'll, we'll get that, that, that video going in a second here. We're trying to get some more connections. Is this... Um, is this my internet? To get an accurate reading, it's important to take your blood pressure correctly. One of the most important factors in taking accurate blood pressure, proper fitting cuff. Once you have the right cuff size, find a quiet environment and rest for 15 minutes. Sit in a chair with your feet flat on the floor and your back straight. Rest your arm on the table with your palm facing upward. The cuff should be level with your heart. Do not talk or move while taking a measurement. Avoid food, alcohol, exercise, smoking, and bathing for 30 minutes prior to taking a measurement. Your blood pressure can naturally fluctuate throughout the day, so taking it at the same time each day will give you more accurate comparisons. For tips on making changes to your lifestyle to lower your blood pressure, visit AmranHealthCare.com. I love that video. It's a, it's a really good video. I want to remember people that um, when you measure blood pressure, that you um, be careful that you put the machine on the right way. So where that little where that little tube comes out, it should be pointing downwards towards your hand. Okay. A lot of key things there in the video, so make sure your arm is at heart height, like Dr. Finney said. Make sure the tube is on that very front of your arm, it's pointing downwards, um, right above the inside of your elbow. And like Nicholas mentioned, make sure you don't drink coffee or smoke. Get some rest before you take the blood pressure as well. The arm should be supported, and the best for most people, the kitchen table is a good place to have the arm supported. Um, you want to be roughly at arm. Uh, at heart level, ideally. And if you don't have a blood pressure machine and you do have issues with high blood pressure or low blood pressure, again, we highly recommend purchasing a blood pressure machine. Um, we have, or the uh, Canadian Hypertension uh, Society does give us a mark or a seal of approval on machines or boxes of blood pressure machines as well. So they have the gold seal of approval or the silver seal of approval. Both of them are acceptable by the Canadian Hypertension Society. We have over here in our office here, we have 
recommended by Hypertension Canada. So make sure it has that that, that, that seal. It says recommended by Hypertension Canada. Uh, they have different uh, different seals look that way. But it's really important to realize that that um, if you want a machine that's being validated, it's calibrated uh, for that circumstance, the ones that are on the wrist, unfortunately, are not validated. And I understand for some people it's more convenient because you have a large arm. Uh, and sometimes with people with extra large arms, we have to make some compromises on, on that. And sometimes we even put the cuff around the, uh, the, the the elbow part, below the elbow sometimes. So, uh, and, and being relaxed. So when I measure my blood pressure, I always, you know, my first inclination is to tighten up. Then I picture myself and I practice all this mindfulness at that time. I close my eyes. I pretend I'm on some nice, warm beach. Um, nice and relaxed, um, and, uh, and, uh, and I measure that. But I notice for me the first one or two blood pressure readings are high. I'm a type A, super A personality, so I have that uh, hot response, so I need to relax my body when I measure blood pressure. Uh, some people, uh, like Emily and some other people, are nice and relaxed all the time. Uh, me, I'm supercharged, and I have to learn not <laughs> to um, react too quickly and uh, just catch my breath and breathe. Um, that, that's how I reflect my blood pressure. So. Okay, so um, there's this very interesting app where it, it's, here I can play a video, I tried it out today. So this is not a replacement for monitoring your blood pressure. I have to repeat that once more time or once more. This is not a replacement um, for a blood pressure machine. However, it is this nice little app that might show us where the future of technology may be going one day. Um, so it's an app where you uh, where you take a uh, you take your phone. You can put the camera up to your face, and just with the camera, it can estimate your blood pressure. So here, I tried this out today. The app told me my blood pressure was one twenty six over seventy four. The real blood pressure machine told me it was one twenty three over eighty three. So it's not exactly the same, it's an estimate, and that's why this isn't a replacement. Like here, I've, I, I made a small little video that shows you how you can, how it works. So here I put the app up to my face, it measures my face, I have to keep it there for about a minute, I'm going to keep going, you see it goes all the way around that circle. Like it's I think the mask. Ah. So they don't work with masks. It's not working with my mask on. Oh, oh. <laughs> so one of the things you have to keep your hands really still. I'm not very good at that. I have a little bit of a tremor right now. And, uh, yeah, how good it is, I don't know. But we're learning. So you know, this new technology. It's, it's a fun toy. Uh, whether or not it's the right toy, I don't know yet. Yeah. So this again, we don't know whether this is validated. They tell us it's not a replacement for a blood pressure. Uh, machine, but this is a very cool glance at where the future might be headed one day. Yeah, so it is very important to log your blood your blood pressure. Uh, make sure that you are keeping track. Uh, if you take your blood pressure twice a day, you can take it in the morning, uh, before your medications, and then in the evening. Write down all your readings as well as the average, and then you know try doing this every day or at least three times a week as well. Um, and then every time you come in for your appointment at clinic or you're on a phone call with Dr. Kernew, have your blood pressure log ready because, you know, we like to see the pattern. We like to see over time if your blood pressure is steadily getting higher, if it's always high, that way we know how to best treat you. So there's two types of blood pressure again. There's your home blood, or three, there's your home blood pressure, ambulatory blood pressure, and the office blood pressure. The office blood pressure is not always the most reliable, which is why we need you to take your blood pressure at home. So if you want a chart that looks a lot like this, um, on YouTube, in the description of the YouTube video, uh, which anyone can go to any time, just go to YouTube and type in Dr. Kernia. It should be one of the first things that pops up. Uh, there's a link for this chart template as well. So now we're going to go over some common mistakes that are often seen when people take their blood pressure. So firstly, um, it's about being in the wrong spot. So you want to make sure um, that you're... Uh, on your cuff to be wrapped around the upper arm. Guys, I know, I know I don't have any biceps, bicep muscles or anything, but you want the cuff to be wrapped around the upper arm and that the lower edge of the cuff is about one inch above the elbow pit. 
you also um, want to make sure that the cup isn't too loose or too tight. So you want it to be a snug fit, but you still want it to be loose enough to allow for two fingers to fit in between the cup and the arm. And again, uh, just to reiterate and really hammer this point home, take um, a lot of people only take one measurement instead of three. So make sure you're taking three and make sure to discard the first one and average out the second and third measurements to get your blood pressure. And of course, talking while taking your blood pressure will also increase uh, your measurement. So try to make sure you're refraining from talking and coffee, smoking, and alcohol 30 minutes prior to taking your blood pressure measurement will end up increasing measurement. So now we're going to talk about ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, also known as ABPM. So this, as was mentioned before, it's a non-invasive device and it consists of an arm cuff and it's connected to a small monitor by a rubber tube. So this monitor is gonna collect blood pressure measurements several times over a 24 hour span. And it can really help identify white coat hypertension, which as Stuart mentioned is a phenomenon where an individual will exhibit elevated blood pressure in a clinical or healthcare setting, but has a normal blood pressure when they're at home and they're being assessed by AP. Yeah. And this is the gold standard for keeping track of blood pressure because keeping track of it 24 hours. So it, it, this also allows an analysis of blood pressure readings at different time periods during the day, which is really helpful when it comes to uh, analyzing or identifying uh, nocturnal hypertension, which is, uh, and of course these non-dipping, the nocturnal hypertension and these non-dipping patterns that are associated with cardiovascular risk. So as you can see here, as Stuart also mentioned it before. Okay, so I'm gonna go run away again and play this video. I love these videos, they're, they're, they're great here. One of the things too, we, where I forgot to mention before you measure your blood pressure, Go to the washroom and make sure your bladder is empty because that can actually bring up your, your blood pressure. You want to be relaxed. And uh, I'm just having another cup of coffee and I realize my bladder is getting full. And uh, so uh, that's going to bring up my blood pressure. Just when I had, when I had that urge to go to the washroom. Um, but, uh, here we go about um, uh, this little video. I love this. <laughs> Like millions of Americans, Emma was living with high blood pressure and didn't know it. There were no early warning signs or symptoms. But Emma's heart was working overtime, putting her at risk for heart disease and stroke. Following a physical, Emma was diagnosed with high blood pressure, also called hypertension. People of all backgrounds can develop high blood pressure. Treatments differ based on risk factors, including age and family history. But hypertension can often be controlled with healthy habits and medication when necessary. Eating more fruits and vegetables, following a low-salt diet, exercising regularly, and quitting smoking are often the first lines of defense to control high blood pressure. Your doctor may prescribe one or more medications to help lower your blood pressure to normal. Some rid the body of extra sodium and water. Others reduce the heart rate or relax the blood vessels. Always take medications exactly as prescribed and don't skip doses. While medications can effectively lower blood pressure when taken correctly, each type has potential side effects for some people. You might feel tired or have trouble sleeping. You may experience a dry cough, stuffy nose, leg cramps, frequent urination, or headaches. If you have side effects that don't go away with time, don't just quit taking your medication. Talk with your doctor and pharmacist as there may be other medications or different doses that can control your blood pressure and have fewer or no side effects. Focus on the benefits. Taking your medication regularly will lower high blood pressure and protect your brain, heart, and kidneys from life-threatening consequences like stroke or heart attack, often the first scary signs of hypertension when left untreated. Control your blood pressure and reduce your risk by knowing your goal numbers and monitoring your blood pressure at home or at your local pharmacy in between doctor's visits. How's Franny? <laughs> she just graduated from obedience school. Pharmacists play a key role in working with your physician to improve blood pressure management. We can address medication concerns and challenges. So 
Talk to us about your treatments and goals outlined by your doctor. If taking your medication feels like a chore, don't just stop taking it. We can counsel you on working through side effects or determine when you need to see your doctor about possible changes in your medications. And we'll share healthy lifestyle tips to keep you on track. Whether you monitor your blood pressure at home or in the pharmacy, we're here to discuss your numbers and provide guidance. Okay, Emma, you're all set. I'll see you back here soon. Visit millionhearts.hhs.com. Well, that's a really good, important thing. So, again, I can't emphasize, or we can't emphasize as a team, is measure your blood pressure often, many times, multiple times, use a good machine. Yeah, and there's one point in this video that I really do did like as well. Uh, if you have any concerns with the side effects, don't immediately stop using your blood pressure. And bring those concerns up with your doctors and you can discuss some sort of plan or strategy to work out with them as well. Um, some interesting statistics. I remember there's this one TED talk that Erica showed me that said um, about 50% of the people who are prescribed blood pressure medications um, don't actually fill the prescriptions and don't take the blood pressure pills as well. So there's a lot of problems with adherence to the blood pressure medications, but like we discussed in the beginning of the presentation, uh, high blood pressure can have very damaging effects on your body. So we have to be careful about treatment. So okay, so I guess we're going to talk about some uh, lifestyle interventions, including weight, diet, and exercise. Yeah. So thank you, Paul. I really like that video because it talks a lot about something we were really trying to hammer home today, which was monitoring your blood pressure regularly. Uh, next, today we want to now talk about uh, a lot of different ways that you can manage your blood pressure and get your blood pressure down, both naturally and we'll also then talk about the various medications that can be prescribed. Uh, so first and foremost, we want to discuss weight loss. Of course, we all know that losing weight can be one of the most challenging things that uh, any person can try to do. We understand that uh, in many ways it's a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, it doesn't matter how many times you've tried, uh, it just matters how many times you have retried and continue to work towards reaching your goals. We do know that being overweight or being obese is one of the greatest risk factors of hypertension and subsequently heart failure. And so making sure that you have an effective plan in place Developing new strategies and constantly trying new things to implement into your routine can be a great way to keep your life exciting, try new things, and also try to improve your heart health. We have talked earlier in today's presentation that just a 10 pound decrease in your weight uh, can significantly decrease your long-term blood pressure. Uh, in fact, losing 10 pounds can lower your blood pressure to the equivalent of half a blood pressure pill that you may be on. Uh, Paul, if we can move to the next slide. So Paul talked earlier about certain scales that we can use to measure heart failure. Uh, one of those variables was something called BMI, your body mass index. Now, whenever you come into the clinic, there's a number of different variables Dr. Kearney was taking a look at. Of course, he advocates for you getting your blood work done so that you can look at all of these different variables. Uh, and another one that he does look at is your weight in relation to your height. Now, it's important to note that body mass index is a uh, common way that many physicians, as well as many patients, have used to monitor how healthy they are uh, on a standardized scale. So what, uh, what a BMI essentially tells us is whether our weight is in proportion to our height. Now, the BMI index doesn't work for everyone, as we know, uh, muscle does weigh more than fat and so for some people uh, the body mass index may not be the most accurate way to assess it but it can just be one of the many ways that you can take control of your health and so if you take a look at the chart on the left side you'll see that you want to fall within that little green bubble right there where your body mass index is between 18.5 uh, to about 25 and the way that you measure this is you just hop on a scale you take your weight and then what you do is you just divide that by your height times your height again. So again, it's just your weight over your height times your height once again. And this will give you a number and then you can assess where you are on the body mass index chart for adults. And if we can move on to the next slide, Paul, thank you. 
Next, what we want to talk about is something that uh, Dr. Kernu has advocated very much for, and that is something called the DASH diet. It's the Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension Diet. Um, Dr. Kernu, you're more than welcome to jump in at any point to discuss your experiences with the diet. Uh, right now, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what this study was, uh, and then I'm going to tell everybody uh, some ways that you can try to implement the DASH diet into your life. So first and foremost, um, Dr. Kernu and Paul have mentioned earlier that uh, when you're doing clinical studies, randomized control trials provide one of the highest levels of evidence. And so this study was done to specifically assess how dietary changes can help people manage their high blood pressure. So the purpose of this study was to take a look specifically at how the common American diet, which consists of alcohol and is very rich in sodium, can affect blood pressure. And in terms of findings, what they were able to uh, extrapolate was that a diet that's rich in vegetables, fruits, low-fat dairy products, low in fats, both saturated and unsaturated, can significantly uh, improve your blood pressure in just a matter of six weeks, which is how long this study was. So what they did was they uh, acquired 459 adults who had hypertension. And what they did was they randomly assigned these individuals to three different groups. There was the American diet, which was low in fruits and veggies and is high in fats. There was the American diet with the addition of fruits and vegetables, so very rich in fruits and vegetables, but also high in fats. And then there was the DASH diet, which was consisting of many fruits, vegetables, low in fats, low in sodiums, no processed foods. And what they found out was that this significantly provided the best results. Specifically, what they found was that if your diet consisted of 23,000 milligrams of sodium per day or less, this can significantly help lower your blood pressure. And in the study, they found by an average of, in terms of systolic blood pressure, 11, 11 millimeters of mercury, and for diastolic, five millimeters of mercury. And specifically, they also found that if you were to go uh, potentially lower for 15,000 milligrams, 1,500 milligrams of sodium per day, depending on the individual, and this is very important, it depends on if this is something that's appropriate for your body type in terms of your physical activity per day. Um, so it's very variable for each individual. This could also provide significant benefits. Um, so we'll move on to the next slide. We, let's first talk about the basics of the DASH diet. So the DASH diet, as I've mentioned, is a diet that's very rich in whole grains, fresh fruits and vegetables, lean meats and poultry, nuts, uh, legumes, seeds, low-fat dairy. Uh, specifically, the most important thing is to try to minimize any unnecessary fats in your diet. And the primary way that that comes from, as we've mentioned, is in processed foods, uh, as well as trying to minimize the amount of sweets and sodium wherever possible. Um, finding meals that are specifically rich in these macronutrients, such as potassium, magnesium, calcium, proteins, and fiber are very important. If you take a look on the right there, you'll see a number of foods that meet this criteria. We're going to go over the next few slides, specifically talking about a lot of foods uh, that can help to get you these macronutrients while also helping you cut down salt, which was the main takeaway from the DASH diet, was that low sodium can significantly lower blood pressure. And so this chart here I took on the uh, U.S. Department of Health, Information and Human Services, talking about the DASH diet. And what they are showing here is the importance of uh, lowering sodium in your diet. It's showing you that there's a lot of foods that you can still maintain in your diet as long as you're making important changes to help reach uh, this goal of decreasing sodium. For example, whole grains, making sure that you're substituting white for whole wheat breads, using ready-to-eat uh, cereal, steel oats, using cereal, rice, or pasta that is unsalted, you'll see will significantly, significantly lower the amount of sodium in your diet. Uh, so one thing that's interesting in this is that um, I found out that how much salt there is in a slice of bread. Look at that, almost up to about 200 milligrams of sodium 
in one slice of bread. Um, I can have six slices of whole wheat toast at nighttime. Um, I've had my, I just have daily requirements of salt in my diet. So if anything, we got this idea that most of the salt doesn't come from the salt shaker, only 25% on average. We don't even have a salt shaker at home. Um, and, uh, and, and, but most of the salt comes from the food that we have we eat. So anything in a box, so if you buy, unfortunately, you know, breakfast cereal, I, it's rich in salt. If you buy, you mentioned oat, steel cut oats, for instance, uh, there's no salt in that. So uh, salt's everywhere. You know, the DASH diet is a, is, a, is a complex diet. I'm not sure if it's the salt, getting rid of that. It's the potassium from fruits and vegetables, the whole grains, that's important, the low-fat dairy. I, I, I think so it's a parcel to that. And uh, so to me, what I'm trying to do is that with the word salt, I'm replacing potassium, that's fruits and vegetables. And uh, to me, uh, really important. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So thank you. Um, in terms of potassium, as Dr. Kearney mentioned, uh, there's a number of different foods that you may be eating or maybe didn't even realize is rich in magnesium, potassium, calcium, fiber, uh, all these good things uh, that you want in your diet. Important. You know, people say, um, I eat a banana a day. What gives you more potassium, banana or a baked potato? Look at your table. Mm-hmm. So you can see a banana. So a banana has about 420 milligrams of potassium. A baked potato has has double the amount. So you know you're better having a baked potato than you are having a banana, by the way. But um, so uh, so. But it's, then there's a whole debate about sweet potatoes or potatoes again. Not to think. I know, but just saying, <laughs> yeah. if you look 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 at look at all the potassium you get, you get potassium from. You know, it's like it's it's amazing. These are the foods that we want to be eating, um, and. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm, you know, um, Chad was on there a few minutes ago. Chad has taught me to put uh, spinach in everything. So um, I have these bags of um, spinach. So I'm having soup. What I do is I, I water it down and I just put a big handful of spinach in there. And, and, and uh, I use the word microwave, we doesn't like, but uh, um, I, I'm finding that I'm just, I'm just adding healthier things. And, uh, and uh, so, so keep, 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 you know, what, what are your, what are your favorite uh, potassium rich foods there, uh, Stuart? Uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, with every dinner meal, uh, my mom and I always have a salad to begin with. It's always rich in, uh, we've actually gone to using more kale and spinach uh, as opposed to romaine lettuce. And as you can see, it's a little bit higher on that chart there, providing us that potassium. Uh, that's something I didn't even realize, actually, but. Uh, that's a small incremental change that's definitely going to do nothing but help us uh, overall. Um, for me, I, I really just like uh, trying to keep things as fresh and natural as possible. Uh, you mentioned when you were cooking that uh, even just washing things down, that's really important because uh, a lot of times, for example, we'll open up a can of something and uh, it's so rich in salt. Uh, if we just wash that down, we don't realize how much of that sodium is actually in there. Uh, if you actually go to the previous slide, actually, you'll see that um, there was an example of just canned tuna, for example. So this is water-packed canned tuna, and in one of these three-ounce packs, there's over uh, 300, 300 uh, milligrams of sodium. But if you wash it down, or if you get the no salt added to it, you'll see that the tuna actually naturally only has about 35 to 45 milligrams. So it's these little things that maybe we don't think about all the time, but are going to be able to make a really big difference for us. Um, so if we want to actually go back to the potassium, um, this is actually a really great opportunity for anyone who's watching on the YouTube page uh, to take a picture, take a screenshot, or if you ever want to come back to it. Uh, these are a lot of the different foods that you can try to integrate into your diet. Uh, there's the table right here that's rich in potassium. We also gave you some ideas here for foods that are rich in magnesium. Uh, and also calcium. We always think, okay, low-fat dairy products, that's where we're going to get our calcium. But it's also in those, uh, those green vegetables, you know, that broccoli, that spinach. You know, you can find this in, in salmon, in beans, in nuts. Uh, so there's a lot of different foods that maybe we don't realize that really have these good ingredients. Um, so you mentioned something interesting, really important, is, you know, people are taking supplements. Like, I would take my vitamins. Mm -hmm. Your vitamin is kale for your salad. Mine is now uh, spinach. 
and that extra baked potato. So those are those. I want nature supplements, not man-made supplements. And uh, and we didn't talk about things like magnesium and calcium that you, that you bring up here. So one of the new controversial areas is dairy. You know, animal protein, for instance. And uh, one good way of getting calcium you mentioned is you know almond, broccoli, salmon, bean, beans, 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 almonds, broccoli. You know these these, these foods have lots of calcium. So you don't. For those who don't want to drink milk, um, you can get lots of calcium other ways as well. And uh, then the magic of magnesium for preventing rhythm problems is in uh, is in spinach and broccoli. There's a question uh, in the chat. What about rye bread instead of white bread? Uh, I, I'd imagine all breads have similar amounts of sodium. I'm not too sure off the top of my head, actually. Yeah, so most most rye bread has a little bit of rye and a lot of white flour. So you have to look at the ingredients. If it, you want whole wheat whole, you don't want like you know, a little bit adds a you know white flour, processed flour, add it with a little bit of rye to it. So the best way to evaluate bread is look at the salt content, the fiber content. And if you pick up a loaf of bread and it gives you a hernia, that means it's lots of fiber. That means it's a good heavy bread. If you pick up the bread and it goes flying across the room, it has too much white flour in it. And uh, so I love bread, and bread has salt in it. And salt, unfortunately, makes you eat more. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to get rid of that um, piece of bread, uh, that toast, and just have a baked potato instead. You feel fuller of fiber, and it's a healthier choice. So... One of the, one of my downfalls is uh, I love good bread, even if it's whole wheat bread, but I eat too much of it. We're all guilty of something. <laughs> I'm guilty of a lot of things. <laughs> I'm guilty of trying to get better, and um, I'm just having another cup of coffee. Oh, <laughs> well, that's actually a great segue into what I want to talk about next, and that's reading labels. Um, uh, before I actually do that, uh, Dr. Kerner just said that his uh, Achilles heel can be oftentimes his breads. Uh, and that's the thing as well is many people will often feel like they're eating the right things uh, and still not see the results that they want. And, and that's often because it's something to do with portion control as well. So something in the DASH diet is you can have these lean meats, but everything in moderation. Because if you're overeating and not uh, or compensating by exercising or living a healthy lifestyle, uh, then you're eating more calories than what you're burning in the typical day. And that's only going to add on uh, to your body itself. So it's really important to understand how to read labels. So there's been some recent changes, I would say, over the last few years in terms of what the nutrition labels look like. Uh, if you see right here, this is what they now look like. Uh, and if I can direct your attention to the sodium label down, uh, I would say two-thirds down the bottom. Uh, you'll see that in this case, whatever that food is, it has zero sodium in it. And if you go over to the right side, you'll see the daily recommended value for how much sodium you should be having in that day. So whatever ingredient that is, one sample of it, one serving size, will provide you with X amount of sodium in the day. Um, and it's important to recognize that on average, you want to be eating about uh, 1,500 to 2,300 milligrams a day depending on uh, your lifestyle and your, uh, who you are specifically. So it all varies a little bit. What's really important to understand when you're looking at labels is that foods that are maybe 20% of your daily value in terms of sodium are, are not foods that you want to be integrating into your DASH diet. Uh, that just as a matter of fact is going to be too rich in sodium. Uh, so, so you want to be looking for anything that's lower than I would say 20% um, specifically wanting to go as low as possible. So being able to understand the serving sizes up at the top, in this case you'll see that it says per half a cup, which is 125 milliliters, uh, this is what you'd be getting in terms of your daily nutritional value. So if you're eating more than that, it's important to be able to multiply or factor in how much more you're eating so that you can see how many calories you're eating, how many carbohydrates you're putting in your body, proteins, and specifically sodium. So, uh, yeah, that's another uh, great point right there as well as we've talked about the importance of moving away from processed foods. Anything that you'll find in a box, in the frozen meal aisle, uh, all of these foods uh, are very rich in a lot of things that you don't want to be putting in your body. Sugars, uh, saturated and unsaturated fats, sometimes trans fats, sodium as well. 
And so trying your best to avoid box products, frozen meals, and processed foods uh, are very incremental changes uh, that can really put you in the right direction. And we'll talk about how to uh, uh, basically try to implement this in your life when you go into the grocery store uh, in just a few slides. So the next thing I want to talk about is what a typical DASH diet could look like on a weekly plan. You'll see on the right here that uh, it provides you with a breakdown of what you could be having for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and some good snack ideas as well, because we always get hungry in between uh, lunches and dinner, it seems, or even late in the evening. Um, what's important to recognize here, and you can always take a screenshot uh, just for inspiration for yourself, is that you don't have to go off of a diet that looks exactly like this. You can pick and choose certain things that you enjoy, try different combinations. It's really important to just have a lot of fun with this. So what I did was I looked on the uh, right here. I took some ideas and I put it into what my typical breakfast, lunch, and dinner may look like. Uh, that's in line with the things that I enjoy. So for me, I love my still cut oats, uh, love my oatmeal, and making sure that I can provide a little bit of sweetness with it with some blueberries, get some natural antioxidants in my body, and then finishing it off with a boiled egg unsalted uh, is a great way for me to get a little bit of protein in there as well. In terms of lunch, uh, some sliced chicken breast, some brown rice, uh, of course in moderation, and some broccoli will help me get that magnesium, help me get that potassium in my lunch. And then for dinner, you'll see salmon, um, as well as some fresh salad, which we showed was very rich in uh, potassium. Things like tomatoes, spinach, kale, uh, even romaine lettuce, and then finishing it off uh, a nice pear or something sweet to uh, help wash it down and give myself a little bit of a treat at the end of the day. So the important thing here is to have fun, get creative, um, and try new things. I think uh, that's the most important thing is there's a lot of things that we can still enjoy and there's a lot of great foods uh, that are also really healthy for us. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, some alterations in the traditional DASH diet. So some scientists went a little bit ahead and they tried a few different alterations of the DASH diet itself. The first one you'll see right here is they tried to modify the amount of sodium uh, that the uh, volunteers or participants in the study were taking. So they had the DASH diet in combination with significantly less than the daily recommended intake of salt and what they found was that this also helped to lower blood pressure. Uh, in terms of the OmniHeart study, they had the DASH diet and they tried different uh, combinations of high carbohydrates or high protein. Uh, and depending on if it was lean meat proteins, you know, uh, moderations of carbs, things like this, uh, it also showed some promising results. And then finally, there was the Premier study, which uh, was traditional interventions to lower blood pressure. They had things like daily exercise, um, getting a good amount of sleep, taking medications. And then in addition to the DASH diet, this also helped to uh, manage clinical outcomes. Uh, I think the important takeaway here is that there are many different alterations that you can implement into your diet. Uh, and it's important to talk to your doctor, uh, speak with your clinical health team, uh, See what works best for you, what works best with your lifestyle, what works best with your particular blood pressure because everybody has a different range and also different types of blood pressure. So um, the next thing right here, we talked about trying to avoid those pro processed foods, those boxed meals. Uh, and we've talked about this in previous presentations, the idea of staying to the periphery of the grocery store. Whenever you enter the grocery store, oftentimes, you'll be on the fruits and vegetables section of the store. This right here, you'll see if you stay up in that section, go across the top, this is where you'll get your seafood, your lean meats, your low-fat dairy products, eggs, milk, uh, specific cheeses as well. Uh, and then once you continue to go back around, then you'll just be at the cash. Oftentimes, what they want you to do is they want you to go to the middle of the store. We naturally gravitate to the middle of the store. This is where you'll get all of those uh, bagged chips, cereals, canned goods, uh, cookies, all those things that uh, we know aren't healthy for us, but sometimes are just too tempting to resist. So it's always a good idea to try to go to the grocery store with a list of the things that you want and try to stay to the periphery of the grocery store. Those are where you're going to be getting the healthiest things to implement into your daily diets. 
Um, another great idea as well is to only go with the money that you can spend to get your weekly ingredients. Uh, going with too much money can be an incentive to maybe get one bag of chips or maybe get that can of Pepsi. Uh, get these things that uh, we all do love, um, but try to avoid as much as we can. And so staying to the periphery of the grocery store is always a great plan. So in terms of added lifestyle interventions, we have exercise, which is extremely helpful because it generates nitric oxide which is a vasodilator, so it opens up your blood vessels uh, by induction of nitric oxide synthase, and this will help lower your blood pressure. So it's recommended that you get 150 minutes of moderate to intense exercise per week. So usually you can split this up into about 30 minutes every single day for five out of the seven days of your week. So what defines moderate exercise? It might vary between person to person, on a case by case basis, but it's the level of exercise at which one is panting, but they can still maintain ta uh, some talking and some conversation to a certain degree. So, some examples of great moderate exercise include cycling, there's walking, there's some light jogging, you also have swimming, and dancing as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about managing your stress and how stress can play a role in blood pressure as well. Right. So one thing that we can always try to practice a little bit more in our daily life is practicing mindfulness. Mindfulness is the state of being completely present with yourself and your mind, body, and spirit. Trying to listen to yourself uh, without judgment. That's the most important thing is you are not stuck in the past. You can't think too far ahead in the future. You just got to stay in the right moment. Uh, I found a quote online, and while it's not something that Dr. Kearney said, it sounds like something he would say. Uh, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn how to surf. So there's always going to be things in your life that are going to be bringing you some stress. That does sound That's like something exactly. you would say, right? So there's a lot of things in life that are going to bring you stress, but you got to find ways to be able to adjust. Uh, so I want to ask Doctor actually is what are some ways that you try to adjust to all the stress in your life? Um, uh, find nice patience. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think is that um, is, I think what you're saying is not to judge and not to react. Uh, one thing I'm, I'm I'm quick to judge and quick to react, and uh, I like to try to help and come up with plans of actions. And sometimes just pausing. Um, to me, my number one stress reliever is, is exercising and um, just being present um, for, and, and just enjoy the moments and take pleasure about the, your, your successes and don't put, you know, as uh, many of us in healthcare are very type A personalities, very goal oriented and just try to enjoy the moment. And uh, what this uh, COVID situation has taught me is new skills and um, and just, yeah. you know, enjoying that moment. I keep saying this, and uh, one of the things I enjoy looking at pictures, I take pictures of patients and all the students there, and I just like looking at them afterwards. And um, um, right now on my phone right now, I, I'm getting, I have everybody's phone number. Now I'm putting a picture to everybody. Um, and it, it, it's a little thing, but it's, um, it's um, and when I go for my bike rides, I'm, um, I'm just calling people on the phone and just chatting with no goals uh, and just to chat with people and taking those moments. So those are the things that um, made a difference. And um, I'm, I'm I'm not pleased that I'm 174 pounds, but I'm not just pleased either. I'm not I'm not mad at myself. I'm um, you know I was talking to a patient today and we had a good laugh about that. She says, Doctor Kern, you your goal is to exercise more so you can eat more. She says. My goal is to starve myself because I don't like to exercise, and uh, she's lost more weight than I did, and she's absolutely right. And um, and so you know, it's just sharing those moments and just enjoying those moments. And uh, one of the things that gives me great pleasure are the, these meetings that we're having right now on the internet, and you guys taking over the world and watching how you guys are doing. And uh, I get great pleasure from your successes and uh, from your things. So keep it up. Um, all right. So 
thank you. The next thing uh, I kind of want to talk about is um, some unique ways that we can try to practice some mindfulness. Uh, so here's a point right here that even just a few minutes each day to take a moment to kind of disconnect, whether it's focus on your breathing, mindful eating, focusing on the things you're eating, the taste, the sound of chewing, uh, or just meditation, for example, can really help lower your stress and help you reconnect with yourself. And this is going to help you also manage your blood pressure. It can provide a number of benefits. It can help slow you down. It can help you know yourself a little better, focus and concentrate. It can help alleviate stress, get rid of those bad habits because you actually take the moment to actually recognize them. Uh, it help you become a little bit more resilient, self-accepting, and the most importantly, uh, something we all want is to have a more enjoyable life. So something that I wanted to do uh, is just to take a moment uh, to do a full body scan with everybody who's listening right now, whether it's on YouTube or who is watching again, uh, to do a full body scan. So a full body scan is um, essentially you just taking a moment to uh, have basically some guided meditation. So what I'm going to be doing is leading a guided meditation where you can potentially close your eyes, relax, uh, and focus on the prompts that I'm going to be providing so that you can try to reconnect with yourself a little bit more. So if everybody wants to take a moment to either turn off the lights, close your eyes, uh, lie down, uh, anything that will help you get comfortable and feel connected. Begin by making yourself comfortable. Sit in a chair and allow your back to be straight but not stiff and with your feet on the ground. You can also do this practice standing or if you prefer, you can lie down and have your head supported. Your hands could be rested gently on your lap or at your side. Allow your eyes to close or remain open with a soft gaze. Take several long, slow, deep breaths. Breathing in fully and then exhaling slowly. Breathe in through your nose and out through your nose or mouth. Feel your stomach expand as you inhale and relax and let go as you exhale. Begin to let go of the noises around you. Begin to shift your focus and attention from outside to inside yourself. If you're distracted by sounds in the room, simply notice this. Bring your focus back to your breathing whenever you can. Now slowly begin to bring your attention down to your feet. Begin observing sensations in your feet. You might want to wiggle your toes a little, feeling your toes against your socks or your shoes. Just notice without judgment. You might imagine sending your breath down to your feet or as if the breath is traveling through the nose to the lungs through the abdomen, all the way down to your toes. And then back up again, through your nose and your lungs. Perhaps you don't feel anything at all. That's okay. Just allow yourself to feel the sensation of not feeling anything. When you're ready, allow your feet to dissolve in your mind's eye and move your attention up to your ankles then your calves, your knees, and your thighs. Observe the sensation you're experiencing through your legs. Breathe into and out of the legs. Let your mind begin to wander during this exercise. Gently notice this without judgment and bring your mind back to noticing the sensations in your legs. If you have any discomfort, don't judge this, just notice it. Observe how all sensations rise and fall, shift and change moment to moment. Notice how no sensation is permanent. Just observe, follow the sensations to be in the moment, just as they are. Breathe in and out from the legs. Then, on the next breath out, allow your legs to dissolve in your mind. 
and move to the sensations in your lower back and pelvis, softening and releasing as you breathe in and breathe out. Slowly move your attention up to your mid-back, and now your upper back. Become curious about the sensations. You might become aware of the sensations in the muscles, temperature, point of contact with furniture or the bed. With each out breath, you may let go of tension you are carrying. And then very gently shift your focus to your stomach and all your internal organs. Perhaps you notice the feeling of clothing, the process of digestion, your belly rumbling, the falling of each breath. If you notice opinions rising about these areas, Gently let these go and return to noticing sensations. As you continue to breathe, bring your awareness to your chest and to your heart and just notice your heartbeat. Observe how the chest rises during the inhale and how it falls as you breathe out. Let go of any judgments that may arise. If your mind waters, gently bring it back the sensations that are now in your hands. And then on the next breath, shift and focus, bring your attention up into your arms. Observe the sensations or lack of sensations. You may notice some difference between the left arm, the right arm. No need to judge this. As you inhale, you may experience the arms soften and release tension. Continue to breathe and shift focus to the neck, the shoulders, the throat. This is an area where we often have tension. Be with the sensations here. It could be tightness, rigidity, holding. You may notice the shoulders move along with the breath. Let go of any thoughts or stories you are telling about this area. As you breathe, you may feel tension rolling off your shoulders. In your next breath, shift your focus and direct your attention to your scalp, head, face. Observe all the sensations that are occurring. Notice the movement of the air as you breathe in or out of the nostrils or your mouth. As you exhale, you might notice the softening of any tension you may be holding. And now, let your attention to expand out to include the entire body. Bring into your awareness the top of your head to the tips of your toes. Feel the gentle rhythm of the breathing as it moves through the body. As you come to the end of this practice, take a full, deep breath taking in all of the energy of this practice. And then exhale fully. When you're ready, you may open your eyes and return your attention to the present moment. As you become fully alert and awake, consider setting the intention of this practice to building awareness that will benefit everyone you come into contact with for the rest of the day. That was very nice. Thank you. So now would be the perfect time, I think, to measure your blood pressure. Um, I think this was a nice little exercise that um, made us realize that it doesn't have to take too much out of your day to just reconnect with yourself. Everybody has five minutes. Uh, sometimes it may not feel like it. Um, but taking just a few minutes to listen to yourself at any point in the day that works for you uh, can really just help you relax, ease your mind. And you might have discovered a few things about yourself. Um, so Paul, if you wanna move on to the next slide. We can practice mindfulness every day. We just did it by breathing in and out, listening to our breath. We were paying attention to all the senses we had in our body. We were listening to whatever was in the room. We were being aware of the things that were happening around us. 
I think it's really important to be mindful. We need to focus on our surroundings. We need to find ways that work for us to relax our mind, process our thoughts. Uh, most importantly, be kind to ourselves uh, and look on the optimistic side of things. Uh, that glass help a half full as opposed to half empty approach. So if we can move on, uh, I want to provide a few resources. Um, of course, many of us, um, especially those who are watching on YouTube right now, are familiar with YouTube. Uh, there are plenty of various tutorials, guided meditations online, um, which provide very similar resources to uh, help you relax, very similar to what we were just doing exactly. Um, and it can be as short or as long as you choose. There are many, many different videos out there. Um, we also have had presentations in the past, so if you go on our YouTube channel, uh, you'll find a video called Managing Anxiety and Being Mindful During COVID-19. This is a great video which provides a number of additional resources, uh, several others that I, I had not talked about today. Um, so that's a, definitely a great idea to uh, log into if you're interested in that as well. Another thing that I really enjoy is this app called Headspace. Um, I have been using Headspace for several months now. Um, I try to integrate it into my daily life once before bed. There's uh, a lot of different resources that this can provide. There's meditation, guided meditations, uh, guided exercise workouts, uh, breathing techniques. There's also uh, nighttime meditations right before bed. Um, so I think there's a lot of different uh, meditation techniques that uh, work for various different people. Um, and I've really enjoyed my experience using this app. So if you want to find it, all you would have to do is just go to the App Store, type in Headspace, and then it will just be the big orange dot. And all you'll have to do is download it. Um, make sure you remember your username and password when you sign in. Uh, and then you can get started on the many different meditations that they have. So when it comes to some additional stress-related interventions, a big thing that would be helpful would be to quit smoking. So smoking increases blood pressure because nicotine, which is one of the ingredients, increases secretion of vasopressin, which is a hormone that constricts uh, the blood vessels and increases the blood pressure. So one of the main, especially in the advertising area, uh, one of the things that's mainly advertised is nicotine replacements. So this includes things like patches, which are really long lasting, gum, which is a bit shorter lasting, and lozenges and sprays. You also want to avoid some triggers that might cause an urge to smoke. So uh, you want to try to avoid emotional triggers such as stress or anxiety. It's really helpful to find an alternative emotional outlet such as exercise. I'm not a smoker myself, but I've found that uh, I've been exercising a lot more recently, and I do get anxiety and stress a lot, so I find that it really helps with that. We also want to try to avoid social groups that have smokers in them, as the social pressure might cause or trigger you to uh, have the urge to smoke. So some other behavioral changes that you could also make in your life with regards to smoking is to occupy your hands and mouth with some simple items, so you can pull stress balls, uh, play with elastic bands, uh, with your hands, or you can chew on some gum or uh, have a toothpick. Uh, another thing would be to smoke with your or your non-dominant hand. And last but not least, uh, it would be really helpful to find a quick buddy for support, as they can kind of stay with you throughout this whole journey. Uh, something that's really important to keep in mind: smoking, or quitting smoking, is really difficult, and there'll be a lot of challenges along the way. And relapse is really common, so. Please try not to get discouraged along the way, uh, and don't hesitate at all to reach out for support. There's still be tons of people, family, friends, health professionals that are willing to support you along the way. So in terms of smoking resources and support, there are a lot of useful resources available, especially in the age of technology. So some helplines and websites include the Smokers 24-Hour Helpline, they are available all the time. Um, the phone number is on the screen and we've linked uh, the website as well. 
Uh, Quit Now and Hamilton Quit Smoking are also great additional resources in regards to smoking. Some apps that were quite highly rated on the App Store or Google Play if you have an Android are My Quit Coach, Quit Smoking, Quit Now and Quit. Now these apps uh, have a lot of benefits including things like motivation. There's also uh, the benefit of being able to connect with other people on the app who are going along the same journey. So that could provide a lot of emotional support. And they can also uh, keep, they can also help keep track of things like how long we've uh, stayed off of smoke. And some YouTube videos, since a lot of you are using, are on YouTube. So Dr. Mike Evans has this video, what's the best, uh, single best thing you can do to put smoking. Uh, there's an ASAP science video. And of course, there's truly uh, Dr. Kearney and some of the volunteers uh, organized a great video of talking about uh, lung disease and how quitting smoking can help manage your lung disease. Um, the smoking section of the video starts at about an, an hour and 30 minute mark, but I would really recommend watching the whole video. It's really beneficial. So just a quick refresher, if um, you're maybe a bit more new to YouTube, but just to find Dr. Kearney's videos and his channel. So first you wanna to go to youtube.com then in the search bar, which is in the top photo, it's that horizontal bar that stretches across with the magnifying glass. So you want to type in Greg Curtin into the search bar, and his profile will pop up. His picture's there, so make it um, pretty easy to identify. Once you click on that, it'll take you to uh, his profile, which looks like the lower picture, and there'll be a bunch of subheadings. You want to click on videos, and this will open up a plethora of webinars and informational videos that you can use as resources to help. So alcohol is another big thing in regards to raising blood pressure. So it increases intracellular calcium, the amount of intracellular calcium ions. So this causes increased sensitivity to endogenous vasoconstrictors, which will, which will tighten up your blood vessels and thus increase your blood pressure. So in terms of alcohol management, first, uh, something that I found um, that's kind of floating around was, that was helpful was a brief intervention. So this is a motivational one-on-one -on -one talk you're going to have with your health professional to kind of assess your, your situation and discuss attainable changes that you could make in your life. Another thing is alcohol moderation. Although alcohol moderation versus going versus quitting cold turkey is kind of a subject of debate as to what's more beneficial. Uh, some people, most people argue that it kind of depends on your situation. So if, um, depending on how reliant you are on alcohol or how frequently you're consuming it, one might be better than the other. But alcohol moderation is a kind of gradual reduction of alcohol consumption over time, hopefully working your way towards uh, being, being abstinent from it or at least not taking it as frequently as you would before. I also do want to interrupt here to say, um, if you or someone you know is a heavy alcohol drinker, it can actually be dangerous to quit cold turkey. Um, alcohol detoxification uh, can have a lot of effects on the body. So if that's the case, speak to your family doctor, another doctor you know, and work towards a plan towards quitting the drink. And a big part of management too is you want to have a great support system. So just like trying to quit smoking, um, you want to have a lot of support and there is a lot of support available from people in the healthcare profession, uh, family, friends, and others who are also in the same position. Some apps that could help are Sober Grid, 12 Steps Companion, 24 hours a day, and I am sober. So a lot of these app trackers to track how long you've been off of alcohol, and they also connect you with other people who are also trying to decrease their amount of alcohol intake. And some helplines and resources that are available, uh, there's the Canadian Center on Substance Use and Addiction. This is um, it's a really big website. They have a lot of information on there. There's also Alcoholics Anonymous Hamilton, which you can phone at any time, and Comics Ontario as well. So one of the things that um, has changed is that one time when I first started, um, we thought alcohol 
had some properties that were good for your heart. Um, what has changed dramatically is alcohol has been found to cause cancer. It's a type 1 carcinogen. Alcohol is associated with atrial fibrillation, uh, with remodeling the heart, uh, enlargement of the heart, damage of the heart. Um, unfortunately, there are no benefits of alcohol from a health perspective. If you enjoy alcohol, uh, you drink because you enjoy it, but realize that it's like you enjoy sugar. Yes, I enjoy sugar, um, but it, it is harmful. And so um, most people who have a drinking problem don't think they have a drinking problem. If you want to know if you have a drinking problem, ask somebody who loves you, who cares for you, and take it seriously. Um, well, Paul said there are consequences of withdrawal of alcohol. I would um, encourage people, I, I, one time I worked in a detox center, going through detox for alcohol is a difficult process, but an important process in the right setting. So alcohol is rich in calories. One gram of alcohol is seven calories. Uh, I'm trying to get rid of my calories, and liquid calories are no good. Alcohol is not a health food. So, um, and I really feel bad about this, is that uh, during the COVID pandemic in, in Canada, alcohol consumption has gone up by 20%, about 30 to 40% in Ontario. Is deemed, you know, uh, beer stores, uh, alcohol places are considered an essential service. I don't know about you, is that uh, it just means we have an addictive problem right now. And uh, I say this with all seriousness, if you want to lower blood pressure, Eliminating two drinks a day will give you about five millimeters of blood pressure that order. Um, you want to lose weight, don't drink alcohol. Uh, don't drink liquid calories. Um, if, you wanna, if you really uh, think about this, is that alcohol has some very enjoyable properties to it, but it has some harmful effects. Uh, for those who are at risk of atrial fibrillation, uh, people have intermittent atrial fibrillation. There's a randomized trial that showed from people in Australia who, who basically tried to reduce their alcohol. You decrease the amount of atrial fibrillation by a third. That's a big chunk. Think about it. Okay. So we talked about a lot of lifestyle factors um, similar to how, you know, uh, hypertension and high blood pressure can lead to many other diseases, it also has many causes, and we covered a lot of lifestyle interventions. I'm going to touch very briefly on some medications that you might uh, be on or some medications you may need, depending on how high your hypertension is and uh, any difficulty or if you face any difficulty getting that down as well. So if you do have high blood pressure, chances are you are on some type of hypertensive medication. There are many, many types. They are very popular and very common. You have ACE inhibitors or ARBs diuretics or water pills, calcium channel blockers, and beta blockers. Um, so I will talk about all of these in uh, brief, but I do want to emphasize, especially when it comes to your blood pressure medications, it's very, very important to keep an updated list of your medication. Have this ready and prepared for you for all your office visits and all your phone appointments. So I just want to say the last patient of the day is a retired physician I saw. And uh, he has a very slow heartbeat. He's had a slow heartbeat for a number of years. He has his list of medication. As he's leaving the office, he said, oh, there's one more pill they've been taking. It was called bisophilol, beta blocker, five milligrams a day. So this person is walking around with a resting blood pressure or blushing heart rate of 36 beats per minute. He is not supposed to be taking medications at lower heartbeat. His list he's had for a number of years has been inaccurate. He says, by the way, I'm on this pill that is killing me. He didn't know that. So, you know, is that um, uh, he had a, a Holter monitor with a six second pause at one point. That was basically because he was taking a medication that his physicians were not aware of. Full surprise and left field. I can't tell you how often it happened. For John Smith, you know, I didn't feel good, so I changed my pills. I have a patient in my practice, a social worker. 
Uh, he now has a bad stroke. He was taking four pills for his blood pressure. He didn't feel well. Stopped all four pills. Six months later, he had a massive stroke. His life is a ruin. Um, all very preventable. So, um, I don't play with my electrical panel. Um, I don't want you to play with your medications without, you know, without the guy. Now, it's not that hard to manage blood pressure when you know what you're doing, but work together. That's why measure and talk about it. So measure your blood pressure, keep a record, keep an updated list of your medications This is one. Well. I, mean, I can't stress this enough with blood pressure medications because a lot of that time, one blood pressure medication isn't, uh, isn't sufficient. Some people might be on two or three blood pressure medications. And there's always the worry of over-treating um, or a case where, you know, like Dr. Kearney just mentioned, where a patient is on a pill that's actually doing them harm. So know what you're taking, know what your pills are for, and be sure to share that information with your doctors. And most people who have serious hypertension will require between two to four blood pressure pills. If you're the Toronto Raptors, you have a team approach. If you're the Toronto Maple Leafs, you have a team approach. Your team approach for blood pressure management, not one pill, it's often combination pills. Best way to reduce the pill burden is to use the proper combination and to apply the best of lifestyle changes. On average, a lifestyle change is worth a half a pill. Okay. So, uh, like Dr. Crane mentioned, you have all-star players on your team. A lot of the time, these all-star players are what we call ACE inhibitors or ARPs. Uh, so don't worry about the names, they're very scientific terms, I just threw them up there for any of you who are curious fellows. Um, essentially, how these uh, medications work is this very, is this very interesting system where um, your lungs are, or you have this protein that's floating around in your body, your lungs are able to activate this protein and they act on your adrenal glands to release uh, what's known as adrenaline. A lot of us might have heard of adrenaline before. Um, you know, you have adrenaline rushes and all that type of things. Um, so you can imagine if you're having an adrenaline rush, your blood pressure spikes up, you feel like you're on top of the world. There's a million things going on in your body. Uh, you know, there's an issue when, when you're, you know, you're just casually living your day-to-day -day life and you have high amounts of these, this can lead to high blood pressure as well. So what the ACE inhibitors and ARBs do is they block either the ACE inhibitor will block the conversion or activation of that protein, and the ARB will stop it from releasing the adrenaline. So here we have a long list of all some of the ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Uh, you might recognize some of these if you're taking these uh, medications. They are quite common medications, like I said, and a lot of the time they're used as first line therapy. So if you need to be on uh, a medication for blood pressure. Very often, this is going to be the first one that is given. Sometimes it might be a diuretic or something else, depending on the situation. There's no uh, one uh, one size fits all for, you, for this, unfortunately. But a lot of the time, this is a first line medication and lowers blood pressure by, on average, 10 to 10 over 6 as well. So uh, quite a bit of reduction, if you remember. Uh, 10 millimeters of mercury can do huge benefits for lowering your risk of cardiovascular. As you can see that most medications have two names, a trade name and a generic name. So you need to know both. Yep. And on your list, on your list, uh, if you can, be sure to write these down. Keep that list with you as well. Um, if any of you are a little more tech savvy, there are apps on your phone that can keep a list for you too. Um, next up, we have diuretics or water pills. I put the bathroom sign here because a lot of us uh, on diuretics might complain about, you know, a constant or frequent urination as well. Uh, yeah, diuretics make you urinate more, but it's uh, literally releasing the water out of your blood, and that's how it gets your, uh, your blood pressure down as well. So it increases the excretion of sodium and water from the blood into the urine, here again, there's a lot of types of diuretics, and there's a lot of names for them. You have different strengths of diuretics, so strong, moderate, and weak. Uh, if you remember early on in this presentation, we talked about heart failure. So diuretics are used very commonly in heart failure. Uh, the weak diuretics, so spironolactone, 
Sometimes this is given in very low doses to increase potassium. So spironolactone, unlike the ones above that will typically decrease potassium, and unlike a lot of heart failure medications that decrease potassium, spironolactone works in your favor to increase potassium. And if you remember to what Stuart, talk, uh, Stuart talked about, you want the potassium, uh, not the sodium. So increasing your potassium to the very So spironolactone also has some extra properties too as well. Well, it's not a very strong diuretic, it blocks certain neural hormones. And it's actually been very important in people with difficult to control hypertension because it actually um, prevents scarring, fibrosis, and it's become very popular. But the downside of spironolactone is it can make potassium dangerously high in some people, um, where the other water fills can make their potassium low. And so that's why when you're going on these medications is that need to have blood work done. So part of me worries about this pandemic that we're living through. We're not getting the right blood work. And uh, there's something called sick day medications that we talked about before. You should look at this over time. Is that, uh, so uh, know what these medications do and know which ones require blood work. For instance, you saw that if you go back one slide, ARB therapy can actually bring up the potassium levels can actually help kidneys or make kidney function worse. So that's why you need to know what your potassium is and you need to know what your you in it. Next slide, if you go forward, the water pills can affect salt and potassium and renal function. Um, and so you really need to, to, to wash those electrolytes. Um, yeah. So like Dr. Kearney said, especially for blood pressure medications, make sure that you get your blood work done before we visit as usual, but it's very, very important if you are on these medications. So diuretics and um, like Dr. Finney mentioned, it affects the potassium, it could affect your kidney function, and we need the blood work to make sure that um, these are doing okay for, and you're, you're tolerating the medication well as, uh, too. Next up we have calcium channel blockers. Uh, this one's a little bit more simple. Calcium is really important in the contraction of the heart, and so uh, by reducing the force of contraction, you reduce the blood pressure as well. So uh, calcium channel blockers, sometimes they're used in patients that have irregular heartbeats as well. So a lot of these medications have multiple purposes. Um, we talked about you know, diuretics for heart failure and calcium channel blockers for some arrhythmias or irregular heartbeats. And if you're on Norvask or Tizac, uh, these are calcium channel blockers. Um, What's quite interesting is that uh you think of calcium blockers, it's not the same thing as calcium in the diet. They have no effect on calcium in the diet. They affect contraction of the heart, and they also affect the, 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 how, how rigid, how strong your, your, your muscles are in your blood vessels. Uh, and they have different properties, where Norvas and Lodipine is a very strong blood pressure pill. It doesn't affect heart rate, where Giltiazem or Tizac is a weaker calcium blocker and uh, does affect heartbeats. Interesting, the major side effect from this category of medications happens to be swelling of the feet. Um, it, it's a relatively safe medication in the sense that it doesn't cause rhythm problems, potassium, or kidney function problems. It doesn't have special properties in effect. But the downside is that it can make the heart pump less forcefully, so if you have a weak heart muscle, it may make that worse. If you're prone to leg swelling, it may make that worse. worse. But it requires very or no really blood monitoring. Um, so it's, uh, it has its pluses and minuses. Okay. And last but not least, we have beta blockers. So beta blockers are very commonly used for irregular rhythms. So if you have a problem with your heart rhythm, you might be on a beta blocker. The medication that Dr. Kearney talked about earlier, um, he had a really slow uh, heart heartbeat. Uh, he was on a beta blocker that he wasn't supposed to be on. That's why... Again, it's important to keep track of your, of, your, uh, of your medications. In younger patients, so those less than 60 years old, beta blockers do have some effect on high blood pressure, albeit it's not the uh, most drastic effect as well. So again, they, they work in similar cascade. They block the adrenaline they get from things like adrenaline rushes or everyday life. Uh, they're also often prescribed after heart attacks or angina and heart failure because they have a lot of benefit in these groups too. A lot of kinds of beta blockers, so here are some common ones that you may be familiar with if you're on them. 
uh, bisophilol, metophilol, a lot of them end in uh, olol as well. So if you see that, you might recognize that you're on a beta block. What's interesting is that when we first started, beta blockers were well used in uh, for high blood pressure management. They, they're, they're helpful in younger people with high blood pressure or if your resting heart rate is over 80 beats per minute. They don't work very well for lowering blood pressure in old individuals over the age of 60 years of age. But they're extremely valuable in people who have damaged hearts, systolic dysfunction and heart failure. It's one of the one of the medications that can make the heart pump stronger. We mentioned in the previous slide that calcium blockers make the heart pump weaker. Beta blockers actually can make the heart pump stronger over time. Um, and you can see that uh, there's, it's again like a, well, like a wonderful orchestra. You have to really combine them and use them properly. If your heart beats too fast, we want to lower the heartbeat. If your heart beats too slow, we don't want to lower it anything further. Uh, but they have some wonderful properties. And people who have congestive heart failure and systolic dysfunction, these medications add extra years of life. Okay. So, big question of the day. Can I stop taking my medications once my blood pressure is controlled? Let's say I'm on two blood pressure medications, and for a week in a row, uh, my blood pressure was the spot on 120 over 80, 110 over 80. Does that mean I can stop taking my blood pressure medication? The answer is no, not without talking to your doctor as well. There is some instances where you know we might reduce blood blood pressure medications, and we'll talk about I'll mention that. So if your blood pressure is controlled, chances are it's likely due to the medications that you're taking. The second you stop taking those medications, your blood pressure is very likely to come back up. Uh, you know, in some cases, let's say you've made some lifestyle interventions, you've listened to Stuart and you've taken on the DASH diet and you lowered your blood pressure through lifestyle um, and with your blood pressure medications, you notice that your blood pressure goes too low, then it might be worthwhile uh, coming off your blood pressure medications. But again, you want to talk to your doctor about that. So, if you, Go ahead. Yep, so if you, again, if you notice any symptoms of too low blood pressure, like lightheadedness, fainting, dehydration or uh, clammy pill skin, then talk to Dr. Kearney. So what should, if you notice those symptoms, what should you do? Measure your blood pressure multiple times in multiple places. Okay? Let's document where we are right now. Now, Stuart showed us the DASH diet. The DASH diet was tested in relatively people with mild hypertension, relatively young, who still had very elastic arteries. You're a person who's 75 years of age, you've destroyed your heart, you have heart attacks, you've had a stroke, you have atrial fibrillation, you have a thickened heart, you've been overweight for 45 years, you have diabetes. Your body is in big trouble, and that situation is that I can, you know, you'll probably never be off medication. Uh, uh, so there's a time and place for everything. Um, now. I've seen many circumstances where someone says, you know, I used to drink, you know, 10 to 14 drinks a week. I, I stopped doing that. That's five millimeters of blood pressure. I lost 20 pounds. That's 20 millimeters of blood pressure. I meditate five millimeters of blood pressure. They can actually get rid of two or three blood pressure pills by making those changes. And you lost the 30 pounds. You kept it off for six months. You stopped drinking for six months. Uh, you're exercising. You're relaxing more. Um, terrific. Um, the vast majority of us, as we get older, our arteries are getting stiffer, more disease, more scarring, more fibrosis. We'll need more medication. We learned it at the beginning is 90% of Canadians over a lifetime will develop hypertension. So you need protection. Uh, right now, we're all recommending masks at this point in time. Um, so it's a wonderful opportunity to, to control. And again, I've seen too many examples where people have stopped therapy and bad things have happened. And one of the bad things that have happened many times, unfortunately, is stroke. And once you have a stroke, you're never the same. Um, uh, so please, please, please think about what you're taking and learning. Um, I know the reflex is not to want to take these medications. They're there for a reason. There's also always good times to discuss. One of the things that we're struggling right now is prescription renewals and refills. 
And uh, it's a time we're not seeing people as much. We're getting about between 10 to 30 prescription renewals a day. We're trying to figure out, are you still on the right medications or not? Sometimes you need blood work to help you guide your therapy. Uh, we need your home blood pressure, and we want to make sure you're on the right pills. Um, people get pills from multiple sources, multiple doctors. People don't know everything about you. I know a lot about your cardiovascular system. I don't know a lot about some other parts of the body as well. If you have a liver problem, I'm not the right doctor. If you have a blood pressure problem or a heart problem or a kidney problem or a diabetes problem or a cholesterol problem, I can help. Hey. So that brings us to the end of, end of our presentation today. It was a long day. You know, a lot of information, but arguably one of the most important uh, topics that we could talk about hypertension. So we have some key takeaways. A uh, high blood pressure can have lots of negative effects, can damage your body and your blood vessels. It can lead to strokes, heart attacks, heart failure, uh, so many more things. It's it's an overall, it's just like a wrecking ball inside your body. So that's something you have to be careful about. There's a lot of risk factors for hypertension. Luckily for us, most of them are controllable. That's your weight, your stress, uh, your lack of exercise, your diet, your smoking, alcohol. Uh, unfortunately, the region genetics aren't controllable, but you know, life hands you uh, cards, you have to work with them, right? Uh, so reducing your sodium intake, losing weight, and getting exercise are great ways to decrease your blood pressure with lifestyle interventions. I got a question for you, Paul. Yeah. And I'll say this to, to Stuart and all the presenters. So I give you a choice. If I was going to lower my weight, lower my alcohol, or lower my salt, in what order will you see the most beneficial effects from blood pressure with that? I think it would be uh, salt, weight, I'm sort of keeping in mind also. Okay. Uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think, Stuart and everybody else? Um, I'll say weight, number one, salt, and then alcohol. Okay. Anybody else? What do you guys what do you think? So is it stress management? Is it um, salt? Is it the weight, the blood pressure, the exercise? The, the meditation. I say salt. And it, 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 it's interesting is that uh, people think salt is the most important thing for blood pressure. I'll say the most important thing for blood pressure is weight reduction. Second would be alcohol. Um, salt would be at the bottom of the list. I mean, it's, it's not, you know, so you know, salt's important, but it's not as important. I would I would give anything to lose twenty pounds, and I'll give you a bucket of salt. I think you're better off. I'm not saying you should have a bucket of salt, but I think you should have a bucket of potassium-rich foods. Um, but you know, really, uh, we, we we put a lot of importance in salt, and I see so many people say, you know, um, I'm not losing weight, but I got rid of the salt in my diet. Guess what? You haven't done a whole lot of good necessarily. So um, I would actually lose the weight. Add potassium to my diet. This this business about meditation and lifestyle changes is that Paul and others pointed out. Quality relationships make you live longer, um, and uh, the, you know the salt may bring your friends back by giving you salt shaker so you can share uh, some, some some broccoli with them or whatever. Um, but uh, to me, is that um, uh, Salim Youssef at McMaster has done some research, and he doesn't think he doesn't believe in salt restriction. Um, I think salt and sugar makes me eat more and makes me more calories. So to me, the number one priority for, for most of us is, is getting that 20 pounds off. And uh, think about your drinking, think about your exercise. And, uh, and uh, so um, um, we have our pluses and minuses. So very interesting. So that's my take on it. Very interesting. So, uh, and then last but not least, medications play a large role in your management of hypertension. Know what you're taking. Keep an updated list. Don't stop medications on your own. Always talk to your doctor. If you have any questions, you can always uh, reach out to us to talk about your medications as well. So there's actually a recent trial or a series of trials that looking at um, people who normalize their blood pressure on medication. So those are the people that you know taking medications for a number of years. They stabilize. They usually lost weight. They're not drinking, they're exercising. Um, 
And then if you cut back and withdraw medication, approximately 50% of those individuals will develop repeat hypertension in the next six months to a year. So if you do decide with the help of your physician that you made those lifestyle changes, you made them for a number of years, and you want to see if I can do less, you have a 50-50 chance that you will require medications in the next, in the next year or so. Uh, so please measure, keep, keep uh, working together with your healthcare team. Uh, but saying that, that people who make lifestyle changes can use half the amount of medication compared to people who don't make those lifestyle changes. By far the biggest lifestyle changes, the biggest and most important one is the weight in my mind. The second would be alcohol. Definitely difficult lifestyle changes, but very important ones. Okay, well, that's all we have for you today. Um, thank you for bearing with us for these very long two and a half hours. Um, but we do hope you're able to learn something new today, something that you can apply to your day-to-day -day life. If you have any questions or concerns, you can email us at drcraney 232 at gmail.com. You can see on the screen here. Um, you can check out our other videos uh, on our YouTube channel, so drcraney.com. Or sorry, uh, youtube.com, search up Dr. Craney and go to videos. Check out our website at drcraney.com. And we do have this nice little attendance form um, that you can fill out. You can set your goals, and uh, I need to update that with a question as well, so I might do that later today. So remember, any concerns, we're, we're always around. Um, and one way, is for those who like text, is drkernu at q32gmail.com. There's, there's, there's the phone. Um, we're going to be calling. We, we, and, uh, we're, we started a new thing that we're going to talk about. Um, so uh, we're going to have, after everybody's gone, we're going to chat amongst ourselves and always try to improve. Uh, so we're going to chat. You want to ch chat with us, please stay on. Those that want to meet us in 45 minutes, where, where, where stairs are going to be at, Paul? The Shadok, you know the Shadok golf course? Uh, well, the Shadok stairs, we're getting back to, to, to that. Um, and I invite everybody every Saturday morning at the 7 o'clock, uh, August not raining, we're going to be at the, the, the Linden, um, Linden Park. Um, and there's two tennis courts, we're going to be there at 7. Uh, on Saturday and Sunday for a tennis game. Um, and you can't be good. We only want people to enjoy themselves. And then those who want, we're going to meet again at 11 o'clock uh, for a bike ride. And um, and uh, so, uh, those are, so those are the weekend plans. So please feel to join us. Everybody's welcome. I want to thank you all for your patience and these wonderful young people who've made us all better. Um, remember, is that practice, practice. Just work at it, and what I learned is not to, to judge as much as we want to. It's just just move forward. Remember, is that uh, if run if you can, walk if you can't, if you can't crawl, just get better. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everybody.